Brianna, what's on your radar? Well, Robbie, you know that meme, the worst person you know just made a great point? <laughs> well, yesterday, Republican Iraq war hawk Bill Kristol made an observation that was so not terrible that it actually got co-signed by New York Congresswoman AOC. Not to sound like AOC or something, he tweeted, tagging AOC somewhat thirstily in the tweet. But the degree to which the Republican Party has become a party of performative populism layered over unabashed oligarchy is pretty striking. Now, he was specifically referring to the fact that the Republican governor of Montana, Greg Gianforte, has been out of the country while the state endures flooding so extensive that the acting governor signed an executive order declaring a statewide disaster. But Crystal could have been referring to any number of things. Billionaires like Rick Caruso and Michael Bloomberg buying elections, the influence of big moneyed interest on elections post Citizens United, billionaires like Elon Musk, Mark Zuckerberg, and Jeffrey Bezos controlling the media, for instance. After all, since the corporate bailouts of the 2008 recession and the Occupy movement that sprung from it, American left populists have been ringing the alarm bell on the fact that democracy is dead. The thing is, though, it's not just the Republican Party that's overtaken by oligarchs. It's our entire two-party system. Now, it doesn't always feel like both parties are equally corrupted. Democrats, on the whole, are more subtle about their attacks on the social safety net, and they tend to use their superficial support for historically marginalized groups as a shield against critique. Hey, they say, at least we're nicer to gays and black folks than the Republicans, Republicans are. On the other hand, some Republican electeds have been smart enough to pick up on growing frustration among the American public for establishment politics, and they've been making gestures toward embracing a sort of working class politics, even if it's mostly rhetoric with very little follow through. We love working people, they say, as they come up with excuse after excuse not to raise the minimum wage while rejecting a windfall profit tax on corporations exploiting the oil crisis to make profit. Now, with Democrats doubling down on their courtship of suburban educated elites and relying on a plan to scare minorities into voting blue no matter who, <laughs> Republicans don't need to do that much to seem like the better alternative to millions of voters who previously identified as Democrats are, or independents. After all, it seems obvious to most folks not named Joe Biden that the system is broken and no one likes to be gaslit. We know the system is broken because a full-time minimum wage salary can't get a worker a one-bedroom rental in 93% of counties nationwide. And two bedrooms are completely off the table. And since the average minimum wage worker is a 35-year-old white woman and 28% of minimum wage workers have children, low wages represent a real threat to the American family. We know the system is broken because in 2020, a CEO earned 351 times more than the typical worker. In 1965, it was just 15 to one. CEO pay has grown 940%, while worker pay has only risen 12% during that time. We know the system is broken because in 1980, the average cost of a four-year college degree was a little over $10,000. It's three times that now. And adjusting for inflation doesn't solve the problem. Average college tuition and fees have increased by 1,200% since 1980. Inflation's just up 236%. We know the system is broken because a Princeton study proved way back in 2014 that America is not a democracy at all. It's an oligarchy. And why do I say that? What does that mean? Well, what the people want has an almost zero effect on what our democratically elected officials actually do. Per the study, a proposed policy change with low support among economically elite Americans is adopted only about 18% of the time, while a proposed change with high support among elite Americans is adopted about 45% of the time. In other words, when rich people want something, they get it. When poor or working class people want something, they're SOL. But enough with the doom and gloom, I don't have to belabor the bleak statistics. You're living them. Maybe you're a 40-year-old millennial who's never owned a home. Only 43% of us are homeowners after all, compared to nearly 80% of baby boomers. Or maybe you're a senior on a fixed income concerned about Biden's plan to hike Medicare premiums right before midterms.
The point is that Crystal is on to something. The Republican Party is performative populism covering for unabashed oligarchy. What both he and AOC fail to say, though, is that it's not just Republicans. It is crucial that people who understand that establishment politics are broken not pull punches when it comes to holding one side or the other accountable. It might be Lindsey Graham trying to cut Social Security and Medicare this week, but as David Sirota pointed out in The Lever, a dozen years ago, Barack Obama and Vice President Biden held a ceremony at the White House to announce a commission to try to slash Social Security and Medicare. But for a sustained campaign led by Bernie Sanders, which included a threat to primary Barack Obama, Democrats, Democrats might have succeeded. Too often, efforts to make life harder for working people are bipartisan efforts. And partisan sniping allows establishment politicians to pass off blame like a hot potato, while no one is ever held accountable. Is Biden doing enough to address inflation? No. But are Republicans offering a viable solution? Also no. Moreover, those of us in the media who are willing to point this out are often attacked by establishment punditry, accused of being in the tank for the other side, even as our criticisms are bipartisan. Wanting to hold Biden accountable to his campaign promises might get you called the Candace Owens of the left, at least if you're black. Explaining why Tucker Carlson is appealing to so many viewers recently caused the co-founder of a popular left media site to accuse me of not being a leftist at all yesterday. The mainstream media is disgusting in how they shut out progressives. Um, in terms of the right wing, no, no, no. Brianna Joy Gray, unfortunately, uh, is one of the people that are in the now the fake left. And so this has become a whole uh, niche part of the industry. So Jimmy Dore, Glenn Greenwald, Brianna Joy Gray, and a couple of others in there. Oh, well, <laughs> here's the thing. I don't care what you call me a leftist, a fake leftist, a progressive, left populist, an independent, a socialist. I've used most of those labels at some point or another. What's important is less how you define folks than that we all collectively keep our eye on the following. Where do elected officials get their money? Who's paying them? Are media figures merely critics or are they offering affirmative solutions to the real problems Americans across the political spectrum have identified? Are excuses like, how do you pay for it, leveraged evenly, or only when it comes to helping out American workers, not when it comes to bailing out banks or funding regime change wars? Do all the reasons floated for why a middle-class life is inaccessible today make sense in light of the fact that just 50 years ago our country was structured differently, taxes on the rich were higher, social spending was higher, unionization was higher, and the middle class was living easier? Could it be that the people telling you things can't get better are self-serving, regardless of whether there is an R or a D behind their names? It is imperative that we keep talking to each other, that we not go into our respective silos, and that we treat everyone who, not, not treat everyone who disagrees with us as a, as a mortal enemy, as some of my colleagues in left media might recommend. When we do that, we stop being a community. We stop being an American people. We've already lost our democracy, according to the fellows at Princeton. If we completely lose our sense of belonging to an American community that can communicate with each other, that strives to be better together, what's left? This isn't a left-right conflict we're in, it's a top-down one. More and more people are realizing this, and that's something to be hopeful about. The trick now is to not let bad faith actors exploit this sincere desire for working class politics and use it to deliver more of the same. So I did this because I, I felt as though. You're a fake leftist. You're going to have to vacate that chair for someone else. I know. But these kind of purity <laughs> tests, they get trotted out as I've observed them. Every time there is someone who is even making an attempt to understand the other side, to dialogue with the other side, and to come with solutions, and to be willing to be critical of one's own party. Yeah. That's what sets people off. That's what sets the Soledad O'Briens of the world off. Not anything substantively I've said, because they, ne they never talk about anything specific. It's the idea that by even being in dialogue with other people, you are somehow 
by definition, throwing your own community and interest under the bus. Yeah, uh, our uh, Rising Fridays co-host Ryan Grimm had a great article in The Intercept this week about the kind of struggle session mindset that prevails in some of these progressive activist circles that's like like a caricature, you know, of what you would, of what someone on my side would say is going on. And then you really go, oh, there's a lot of that going on, actually. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's the problem is that it's elite capture. Yeah. It's these people at these institutions, it's not a, what I think is a broader, authentic left movement. It's these, you know, kids at Oberlin or whatever who are populating a lot of these left groups and these media institutions that have elite interests because they are elites and they are co opting the priorities of the identity groups that they might technically belong to, but they don't have the same interests as those groups. So, you know, affluent, you know, black people on TV or affluent LGBT people on TV focus the conversation toward things that aren't the immediate interest of working class people in all of those groups. And I talk about this with Pascal Robert actually on my podcast today, who he gets into the, the history of how movements have been co-opted in exactly that way and how identity oftentimes collapses the real meaningful differences, class differences between the people who are advocating for these groups at the top and what's really going on down on the, on the streets. Yeah, I, the, the effect is pretty clear at this point that working class people feel a declining affinity for the Democratic Party. They are increasingly being captured by the Republican Party, which you know, from your perspective, it should should not happen given the relative uh, positions of the parties. And it, I mean, it, it speaks to, I think, I know we've talked about this a lot, but it, 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 it just is the effect, right? That the many working class people feel that they don't trust the Democratic Party or they've overreached on cultural issues or they don't you know, trust what their policies are for taking care of their families or whatever it is. And uh, and that's a huge problem for the Democratic Party because then it's just going, it's becoming increasingly reliant on right, the, the affluent white liberals. And that's by choice. Right. That's by choice. They don't, they've chosen not to respect their base. They've chosen to write them off as stupid rubes right. who don't know better. And, and none they, of us like the policies of affluent white liberals. Nobody, no, nobody, nobody does. <laughs> nobody nobody does. does. It's the most uniting thing of all. And they don't, they don't trust that if they were actually just to deliver, that they could actually mm -hmm. best Republicans on some of these um, culture issues. And then meanwhile, the bar is so low that Republicans can get a, away with yeah, performatively that, signaling populist politics. That it, and that they can get away with massively overreaching on their response to culture issues that some of their zanier, crazier people in their yeah. base want because right now the Democratic Party is so screwed they can do whatever they want. Yeah. And that will be horrifying. <laughs> well, we'll have more rising right after this.